Uh, today we're talking with Senate District 6 candidates, Democrat David Cox and Republican Travis Hudson. Um, I'll start with you, David, sorry, since your D comes first. Um, can you just tell us why you're, why you're here and why you want to do what you're doing? Absolutely. And who you, basically, who you are. Absolutely. And then just tell us why you're here and why you're running for the Senate. Great, seat. great. Okay. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, my name is David Cox. I'm the Democratic nominee for uh, Florida Senate District 6. I'm excited to be here today to talk to uh, you folks and, and the folks here in St. John's County. Um, first and foremost, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm in this race to better our community, to continue the dialogue that we've been having back and forth and figure out ways uh, that we can move this community forward. Uh, not only St. John's County, but Flagler County, Volusia County, and Putnam County are extremely important. Uh, I just came off a congressional race uh, in 2014 uh, and continued on because I think we need to do more uh, in Tallahassee, we need to do more for this district. We've got to make sure funds are uh, allocated here. We've got to do more for our environment, uh, more to improve our business uh, community here, and, and again, just improve quality of life here in the district. And you're from Volusia County? I do. I live in Daytona Beach, yes, sir. And you're not from Flagler County? I'm not from Flagler County. I sent him to Flagler County. I, I warned him in Flagler, or put him in Flagler County, so I, I apologize for no that. No worries. Go ahead, Travis. Uh, Representative Travis Hudson, uh, House District 24, which covers St. John's, Flagler, Volusia. Live in St. John's County right off of Wildwood Drive. Uh, went to Pedro Menendez High School, so I've, I've been a resident here for a while. Um, in a nutshell, I'm a realtor by trade. Worked for a family business when I first ran for office. Ended up working for Mr. Watson, so I was selling homes. And for the first two years of elected office, I was selling homes in Palm Coast. Now back in the family business, things have picked up a little bit with our, with our timber uh, and agriculture operations. So in a nutshell, I've got a little bit of ag and real estate background and um, been happy to serve for the last two years. And you know, the reason I decided to run for this seat when Senator Thrasher left was this district, uh, as, as David said, St. John's, Flagler, Volusia and Putnam, why well, I had already represented three of those four counties. So I kind of felt like I had a good inside knowledge of uh, the needs of those counties and I've been working with those counties and, you know, hopefully I can continue to do that and, and currently right now I'm doing that. So uh, I felt like I was the one to put my best foot forward for this, this position and that's why I chose to run for this seat. Great. David, they say that if you get outspent in a campaign, you may have, you may have a disadvantage. Today you have four hundred fifty dollars, and you have five hundred thirty thousand in here. Does does that do you want to comment on that? Do you have a <laughs> sure <you> make <laughs> sure money doesn't buy votes. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it certainly helps, but uh, this has been a grassroots effort from the beginning. Uh, we turned the congressional campaign in the four counties directly into uh, the campaign to run for state senate and to step forward and make sure that Democrats were represented. Um, and so that's what we've been about. We've been about the grassroots. I spent two years on the campaign trail here through the four counties, really listening to the voters and listening to what the needs are um, of the district. And that's what we're carrying into this. And uh, the money doesn't uh, affect me and it doesn't change how we do things. Uh, I'm a teacher. I've dealt in the classroom for years and years uh, not having enough money. And so um, we're on the, uh, on the ground. It doesn't cost to make phone calls. It doesn't cost any money to knock on doors. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're talking to the voter. We're bringing it directly to them. Um, and that's uh, how we're going to continue this campaign into the end. Our fundraising has started to pick up here uh, in the last two or three weeks, and uh, we're going to go hard to April 7th. Is your campaign, is that, some, is that still yeah. left over from? No, by, is this by, all, by state all, law, uh, yeah. uh, as of session starting of May 2nd, I, or I'm sorry, March 2nd, March 3rd, I'm not allowed to solicit or receive any campaign donations. So I've my campaign, no more money. Uh, in terms of coming in, we've got a little bit left over that we've been just to a mail out, letting people know, you know, we're still running in a race. Um, you know, it's, it's like David said, money doesn't buy votes. Money just gets your message out to let people know you're running. And in the primary, you know, I was focused, like David was, on a, a strong grassroots campaign because I knew I had to get out there and get to the community. Uh, I represented three counties, but had never been in Putnam, and quite honestly, hadn't really been in North St. John's. As representatives, you try not to step on each other's toes. So I walked, knocked, the whole campaign team in the primary hit 7,000 doors. Uh, and we kind of took it a step further. If a volunteer walked and knocked on a door and someone had a question for me, we asked if we could take down their name and number, and I would personally call them to answer some of those questions. So we took, we didn't take that lightly. 
Um, I think it showed in the primary that you know that grassroots effort is a big deal. People like hearing from their their candidates and and knowing that they still care about the community and that stuck over in Tallahassee or D.C. They're actually back home listening to what you have to say. So that's kind of how we ran our campaign and we were successful with the primary and we're doing the same as best we can. Although we're in session and I'm still in Tallahassee most of the time, mm -hmm. it's best we can when I'm home, you know, just getting out, going to events and making sure people know there still is an election. You know, you brought up Putnam County. It brings up a question we haven't asked other ones. Do, do you have a, a, a stance on the Rodman question? I do. I mean, you want me to go first? Please. I will. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've said it to the paper several times. Uh, Rodman Dam, the constituents wanted to stay up, and I'm always going to be for the constituents. Uh, missed a meeting because I was in Tallahassee and had some errands to run uh, with Save Rodman, but I was going to go to Save Rodman and tell them my stance. You know, if, if Jacksonville or, or Northeast Florida and the Jacks Chamber wants to find a common sense solution and reach out to the people in Putnam and figure out a way to make everything work and Putnam's on board, that's one thing. But what happened was Jacksonville said, we want it down. And Putnam said, we did not. And I will always, whenever there's a line drawn in the sand, I will always be for the constituents rather than political gain. And, and in this one, I'm, again, yeah, I don't think Putnam County even had a chance to say we don't want They weren't in the yeah, table. Right, Are you right. familiar, familiar with that? Or do you have a... Do you have a Absolutely. So uh, in the in the congressional race, I represented uh, about half of Putnam County, and I've had the opportunity now to get out uh, to the rest of Putnam County. We have a new Democratic club out in Melrose, which is great. We were out there uh, about a week and a half ago. So we had the opportunity to talk to voters. And, and uh, you know, echoing what Travis said there, uh, what the constituency wants is what we need to take to Tallahassee. Uh, we need to remember that as elected officials and as politicians. We need to remember that um, we need to talk to our constituents and make sure we really understand what they want. Um, as Travis said, Jacksonville wants something different than what Putnam wants. And so uh, what the residents of Putnam County want, what they need is what we need to take to Tallahassee and make sure we're representing them, uh, hence the name of representative. Okay. Sure. Um, if you're elected, uh, what do you see as the top issue that you would be tackling in uh, Tallahassee uh, under your first term? Sure. Education has always been my top priority. Um, I've been in the classroom now for a um, little more than 10 years, uh, teaching at the middle school and high school level. Now I teach at Bethune-Cookman University. Um, where I'm proud to be a wildcat and proud to be down there. Um, I believe we need to focus on funding education. Uh, we need to put more money into our public schools. Uh, we need to look at uh, ways to um, make sure that the teachers are taken care of. Uh, I'm against Common Core. Um, I believe that we need to take the handcuffs off of our teachers and let our teachers teach. Um, I've always been a firm believer that the teacher knows what's best for their own individual classroom, and every classroom is completely different. So um, take the handcuffs off our teachers, let them teach, and make sure that they have the resources available to teach um, effectively. So we need to funnel more money into our public schools, public education, um, more money to our teachers. Um, it, you know, year after year after year, our teachers get left out of raises um, and get left out of uh, the discussion. So we need to make sure that they're represented. Um, I also believe in expanding education for those um, who college maybe isn't the best uh, fit for. Although I teach in college right now, I believe in trade schools. Uh, I believe expanding the hands-on education. Uh, I believe expanding our power of our unions and making sure that those that um, are going to get in and build and construct and do our hands-on trades are educated as well. So we need to look at those and how we can expand some of our industrial arts and industrial education. Um, my bachelor's degree is in technology education, so I believe expanding that as well. So education is definitely my top priority. Okay, I'm gonna have one follow-up question and then I'll go over to you, Travis. Okay. okay, so you say we need to spend more money on education. That's great. Where do we get the money from? What bucket does it come out of in order to shift over to education? Well, you know, our lottery funds were designed to go into education, and we now know that our lottery funds don't 100% go into education. So let's start right there and look at where our lottery funds are and make sure that 100% of our lottery funds are going into education instead of being kind of picked at and, and broken off um, in different ways. Okay. Thank you. Travis? Uh, number one priority. Right now, I am elected, so I'm working on stuff right now, working on uh, mostly appropriation side of things. Uh, you know, Senator Thrasher, uh, without having a senator uh, to get the money across, you have to have it on both sides of the aisle. It has to be matching in the House and the Senate. We don't have a senator right now. Uh, three of the four counties does not have a senator. So I've spent most of my time up there in the first couple of weeks going to the other side of the aisle saying, hey, guys, this is what St. John's, Flagler, Volusia, Putnam want in terms of appropriations. I need you guys to somehow get this in here for me on the Senate side. Or... 
I'm working on the house side. I need to get it in so I can go put it in on the Senate side. So that's really what I'm focused on just as of right now. I think the biggest thing that I would run next year, and there's a lot of things, but we passed a, a, a committee bill two years in a row now from the House side, and for some reason it hasn't had traction in the Senate. But what it does, basically, when we pass bills, we give rulemaking authority to different agencies. And the rulemaking authority is given to them, and they write the rules based on what they thought legislative intent was. Well, sometimes they can get off on little tangents. It's not their fault. They don't know exactly what we were thinking. So what this bill would do when they have the power to make this rulemaking authority, it would come back to us the following year to grant final approval. And that way we can amend or strip if they go a little too far or if they don't go far enough to give back that power. I think as representatives and senators, we are elected by the people to represent them. We pass laws for them. But there are other people in, in, in these agencies that aren't representing the people that are just trying to do a good job, but sometimes not, might not hit the nail on the head. So I think we need to bring some of that back and make sure that we have a final checks and balance over that. Uh, that's probably the first thing I would you know, try and pass as the Senate, on the Senate side, because it has passed on the House side in two years, just to make sure that we have final approval on some of those agency rulings. You jumped into Common Core straight off. Do you want to talk about Common Core? No, go ahead. I mean, you, you said you had a follow-up. No, it was. It was the bucket question. Okay. But, but you want me to follow David up to, yeah, to yeah, the education? Yeah. Well, well, you know, David and I actually see pretty eye to eye on a lot of the education issues um, with a little bit of caveats. But, you know, Common Core have been against it with five, or co sponsored the anti Common Core bill last year by Debbie Mayfield. And, and what that bill basically said was hey, guys, before we jump into the fire, why don't we, why don't we wait for a year or two? You know, let's, let's not just go into the deep end of the pool, let's, let's test the waters a little bit, slow everything down. You know, I think when you talk about children's education specifically, you shouldn't make rash, harsh decisions split second. Uh, you're affecting someone's lives over the next, you know, K through 12, 12 years. I mean, it's 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 big things that you're you're dealing with. So, uh, you know, as as David mentioned, I, I kind of believe agree with him and said it before. You know, we have good teachers. Let's let us let them teach. Now, I do believe that we do have to have some tests and accountability just to make sure we can have some measurement tools. But when you get into that, I think, I think we had some great ideas from the Republican side of things or from the legislature side of things of testing and accountability. But I think we kind of overkilled it. We, we kind of put way too much in the pot. I think we need to come back from that. You know, I'm in favor of let's, let's do maybe a test in second or third grade with reading and mathematics, make sure they're on par. And if they need to get caught up, let's, let's worry about that. Let's do a test in middle school, and let's do a test in high school. And, and I've always kind of said, instead of all these tests that are out there, air park, all that stuff, if we really are talking about kids being college ready, well, there's two tests I know that college look at, the ACT and the SAT. Why isn't that our measurement tool to see who's college bound? If that's really what the state of Florida wants to do, that's something we should look at. Then we could look at which, which kids are doing well and which aren't. That could be our accountability, that could be our measurement tool, and then we can start focusing on that. But when we say we want them to be college ready, and we start giving them tests that colleges don't even care about, I mean, I don't know about you, David, as, as a college teacher, but I've yet to hear a teacher say, that's great, you got a 3.8 on your SAT, or on your GPA, what'd you make in park or air? They just, they don't, that's not on their, you know, their uh, prerogative. So I, I think we should start teaching to something that if we are going to be college bound students to something that will actually get them into college. I also am a big believer in the CAPE or vocational model, the trade skill model. Um, I think there's a good um, a good avenue there. I, I want it, we, you know, we started putting it more back into high school levels so that we can find those kids that aren't college bound and start getting them a, a passion to learn. You know, whether it's carpentry, construction, tourism, hotel management, agriculture, we're getting that passion and we're starting it early on. And then we need to make sure we take that passion to maybe some of our state colleges uh, or some of our, you know, what we would call community colleges before they move to state colleges. So, you know, they get that passion, they want to go that route, and now they can get in and start learning that route. You know, I want to take it one step further. I want to, instead of the state always giving money, you know, for capital improvement projects, I think it's a great thing, but I think we need to have more private public partnerships. I think that we need to get businesses to invest in. We've got a good one here with Ring Power. If you can invest in capital improvement dollars to one of our schools, we should give you a dollar for dollar tax credit back. We should incentivize you for wanting to come in, wanting to teach our children, and then hire them from into your workforce from our schools. And you know that's one of the, the bigger plans that I'll probably focus on more long term when, when it comes to education. Standards test 
testing and the, the crashing of the system and the fact that the, the testing is going to count this year when and there's there are a lot of people in our community here up in arms about what's happening mm -hmm. and the fact that it's counting and it's not the platform is is uh, stressed and so I just wanted to throw it out there. Do you guys have a position on, on this uh, this mandate from the Department of Education or the State and Department? And maybe specifically because that's mm -hmm. you guys are going there. There's Senator Montfort's bill. I think mm -hmm. is is probably the leading, the, the most, the toughest one on that. So if, if do you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, well, when it comes to you know, I I, I think we got to get back to the local control. I mean, when you start mandating stuff from the state level. I don't know anyone in Tallahassee that can tell David Cox how to teach his students or any teacher here in St. John's Flag Revolution. There's, there's no one smarter than the teachers that are seeing these kids and understanding these kids. So we got to get it back to the local level. You know, we set those, like I said, those, those achievements and those standards with the smaller testing. But when you start overkilling all these testing and mandating all this stuff, and now we're running it from the servers from the Department of Education, you're going to have these problems. We don't have the flexibility there we need to have. So in my opinion, we need to get it back to the locals, but make sure we have a little bit of oversight still in place from the state level. And uh, I, I share in the frustration. Uh, I share in the fact that um, you know we're talking about maybe now doing baselines for some of these tests because the scores may be terrible. Um, you know, I, I think that we need to have something in place if we are going to say no baseline. Maybe some executive authority to the governor. If for some reason everything looks bad, the governor could come in and say no, no, no. We are going to do a baseline down. We. We, we thought we didn't need it, but we definitely need to. So we need to have some checks and balances because the unknown out there is really scary. And as I said, it's a child's education. You're talking about 12 years of their lives that's affected. And this year is going to be the baseline for that. Whether it works or not, we don't know. But there needs to be something in place to make sure we have a checks and balance over that and that we can go back and reset the clock if need be so no one gets hurt. You know, right now we have a runaway train with our testing system, and it just kind of has been going like that uh, for many years now. And, and, you know, the governor just pulled back on the 11th grade test, um, which, you know, I applaud him for. Um, but we need to take a look at what we're doing um, as a whole, K-12, not just at one test. and not. We need to take a look at it as a whole. And I've always been a person to not reinvent the wheel. And there's other states out there that have testing models and that test their students and, and do a wonderful job at it. And New York is one. Uh, they have a region system where they test their students. And it's a great model. It's been working for years. Um, we need to start looking at what some other states are doing and how they're testing effectively. Because our system is so broken right now. Um, and I, I feel as we're just so far down the tracks, we need to pull back a little bit uh, and, and reevaluate all of that, which takes uh, work at the state level. Um, but as Travis said, you know, I, I believe in some oversight. But again, our, our county school districts here, um, they know what their students need. Um, there's vast differences even in our own community here, even in our own district. There's vast differences between what Volusia County Schools needs and what St. John's County Schools needs or what Putnam County Schools needs. Vast difference. And the only people that know that are the people that are on the ground each and every day working in the school system with those students. Um, and so to kind of pontificate from... Uh, Tallahassee and say this is how we're going to do it. Um, we need to bring everybody back together um, and kind of start over on the drawing table. Thank you. Um, an, an issue that's I'm probably getting more pressed than it ought to is the, is the guns on the, on the college campus. You guys want to take that one? Sure. This is sure. probably where you're going to have the most back and forth right here. Uh, you want to go first? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I am adamantly against guns on college campuses. Uh, I don't feel that guns have any place in our educational system um, at all, period. Um, I teach at Bethune-Cookman uh, University where we just had a shooting uh, about two weeks ago on the college campus. Um, two students, and they're still trying to uh, find those students and, and figure out what happened. And um, as I had said uh, in our Flagler County Forum, uh, if guns were allowed on campus, uh, now instead of two students with guns, we would have had 15 or 20 students with guns, and it would have become the OK Corral. Bullets would have been flying everywhere. Um, and so we need to have stronger uh, restrictions on uh, guns on campus and make sure that we're doing this the right way. Um, again, putting guns in, in young people's hands uh, to go to college with and, and carry a weapon on, on a college campus is only going to create uh, more panic. It's only going to create more problems in that event um, that a shooter is, is present. Um, we have security at Bethune-Cookman University that are armed and are trained to deal with that. Our state colleges and universities uh, have officers on campus that are trained and ready to handle these situations if they arise. Adding more guns into it is only going to cause more problems. 
and this is, like I said, where we disagree. And I, I hope I, I hadn't spoke to you since, but I hope that you guys are doing all right, recovering from that that, that tragedy. Um, you know, that individual. I, I got to see the film. That individual was there for a little bit, pulled up next to the car, taunted. It looked like taunted. Uh, another student pulled a gun out and, and then hopped in the car and ran off. And you know, when you look at that video, it, it looked like that guy had hate in his heart, had ill intentions, and had no fear because, in my opinion, it's a gun-free zone. You, you say you don't want guns on campus, but the reality is there are guns on campus. You can't, I mean, if you went out there and frisked every child that walked in, there are people out there with, with ill intentions that have guns in their pocket that are on campus today that we can't stop unless we literally put everybody through security measures. And I just don't think that's something we should mandate to our colleges. So you, you talk about uh, kids that are going to have them. Well, my definition of a child is under 21 years old. I think if you're over 21, you're an adult. Well, that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about concealed carry weapon holders. You gotta be 21 years old. And we talk about everybody having, and that's just not statistically possible. If you look at it, there's 20 million people in the state of Florida. 1.5 million are concealed weapon carry permit holders. It's about 7%, you can check the math, about 7%. That's the one that's 21 to death right now, right? 1.5 million. So if 7% of the population of that is a concealed carry permit holder, I'm guessing, and I, again, it's a guess, you're talking about 1% to 2% of the students that could be in that 21 to 25 that's still in school. And then the most important thing that's, that's, that's for me, that why I'm for it, is, is, is very simple. A lot of these people are retired military, military that are coming back. Well, how can I possibly tell someone, thank you for your service overseas, thank you for defending our country, but you can't defend yourself in the state of Florida? And when it comes to the Second Amendment, I don't think the Second Amendment should apply everywhere except. I think the Second Amendment is, is a valid thing in our Constitution, and it should, be, it should be across the state. There should be no exceptions to it. But you know, the, the good thing that I, can, that I think is the ultimate fail-safe is this. It has to be a 21-year-old concealed carry or older concealed carry weapon permit holder, and they have to go through various background checks. And if you have a missed mirror to your name, you cannot pass that background check. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. These are some of the most upstanding, uh, righteous individuals uh, in our community. And to my knowledge, I've yet to hear a concealed carry weapons permit holder go to a college and shoot up a college. I've heard others that aren't concealed, but I've yet to hear a concealed carry weapons permit holder. So that's why I'm adamantly for the bill and a co-sponsor of it. And you know, Charles, I just want to respond to that because you talk about our, our military and our vets coming back and, and them not being able to have a weapon on campus. You know, there's there's different statutes in our state which allow uh, law enforcement officers to carry their, their weapons on campus, even mm -hmm. if they're a student going there uh, for school. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can look at um, certain situations like our, our veterans or our military or even active military. Um, and I think that's very different than allowing a 21-year-old student who's there to go to school um, who's there in certain cases to party and have a good time uh, to arm them. Um, you know, it's just the same as bringing guns into bars, right? We're introducing alcohol into a situation. Well, parties happen on college campuses each and every day. Um, parties in dorm rooms and things like that. So now we're going to introduce a gun into that situation. How do we know that that gun is uh, locked and is safe and is protected? How do we know that it's not falling into the wrong hands on campus? And I agree with you that... Um, there are guns on our campus. We know that there's guns at Bethune Cookman University. I mean, we're not, um, you know, we're not uh, denying that. But I think allowing additional guns and additional firearms to go on campus is just school's not the place for it. Take it down to the gun range. Uh, keep it at home. Uh, keep it locked away and keep it safe. But bringing it into a classroom, uh, there's no need for a gun to be in my psychology class in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's no need uh, when I'm working with students for a student to come in uh, for a session with me to be armed. Uh, again, it's a school zone. It's a safe zone. Uh, there's just no need for it there. Keep it at home. I have uh, no problem with concealed weapons. And, uh, you know, uh, my father and I have had guns for sport for for many, many, many years. Uh, I'm not opposed to guns, uh, but the schools just are, are not the right place to introduce these. Right, and just to respond back to that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the flag reform, and I'm still working on this, but uh, when you're talking, the, the one caveat I had on the, the, the Cary campus, and you just kind of mentioned it, if you live on campus, if you live there, and you're a concealed weapon permit holder, 
uh, you must, if it's not in your possession, have it locked in a safe or have a trigger guard on it. The current law basically says if you live at home and you have minors around, minor being under 16 years old, you have to have that. Well, I think that's a great provision to have if you live on campus. Unfortunately, we can't help off campus stuff. But, you know, when you talk about the parties on campus, to my knowledge, you're not allowed to drink on campus. Now, I know what happens, but what could be better is our college is policing it a little more. Uh, my school where I went to, you weren't allowed to drink on campus and there were serious repercussions if you did. Serious probations uh, and violating some of those probations could lead into ex expulsion. So, you know, we cracked down really hard at my college on drinking on campus and it had been like that for a while. Um, so I think there's other precautions to take, but when you say you don't know why it should be needed or why there should be an armed person in a classroom or your classroom, I think the Florida State case is the one reason I can point to having it. An individual entered a library and started shooting like crazy. Thank God he stopped and walked out, but there is another individual there that had a concealed weapons permit, did not have his gun on him because it was illegal, that could have stopped that situation if it escalated. Now, but again, you, you don't thank know that. God it did not escalate, but at least the police weren't there at the time. If he did start reloading his gun and pulling the trigger again, that individual, if he had a gun on him, could have prevented that situation. So, it, and his it, bullets could have strayed off and hit another student, and we could have even had uh, more problems there. Uh, we we could have, but we could have also ended the situation a lot quicker than it was. I just don't think that individual that has a concealed weapons permit should not be allowed to defend himself if someone else comes in with ill hatred in their heart. But you're that's saying my, that all you're saying opinion. that all people that have concealed weapons permits uh, are good, upstanding people with no ill will in their right. heart. And we know that I just asked the, the question, case. name me a concealed weapons carry permit holder that's gone in and shot up a school. And, and that I, I can't answer that yeah. right now. But uh, again, <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there's different cases around uh, with people with concealed weapons that have gone in in, in situations and uh, not necessarily shot up a school, but, but shot up other areas. I mean, so not everybody is there. And, and again, schools are a place to learn. They're a place to go and expand your horizons and learn. Uh, it's a great environment uh, to really um, find yourself and, and learn more about uh, our society. And, and bringing a gun in there is just, you know, we're going to be at odds on this one because it's just not right. the right place. Thank you. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> we'll go back to education and trust. Mm -hmm. I think you, you might have said something about it when you talked about giving ring power a dollar. It, it's an dollars. idea that, for a tax incentive for a provision. Well, isn't, that what, isn't that what vouchers is? Vouchers. School vouchers. I mean, there's tax credits to, for private schools. We we do tax credits with the voucher program for individual parents, uh, is what we passed last year. Is what you're talking about? The, the concept of voucher is if you don't like the school you go to, we hand you a voucher and you can go to a different school. You pay if, if you're in Duval, for example. This has been the long-standing concept. Now we haven't done anything with it recently, but if you don't like your Duval school, you pay a tax to the state of Florida. That's your parent. You pay a tax. We hand you that tax certificate back, a voucher, and you can go to St. John's and say, I'd like to apply for your school. Here is the voucher to pay. Although I don't pay tax dollars in St. John's, so here's the voucher from the state. We did do a tax credit scholarship last year for individuals that were in low-income families that were stuck within a poverty trap, uh, that were stuck in public schools that said you can't afford some of these either charter or private schools, so we're going to give you a tax incentive voucher through the, I think it's called the, uh, it's either the Healthy Start or the uh, First Step program. Um, and that's something we put into law. Uh, and, I think it's currently being challenged by the courts now, too. You know, Travis, that was a first step. But see, the voucher program, that just benefits the wealthy. That makes it so that the wealthy students and the wealthy parents can send their school to anywhere it wants. But we look at our impoverished areas where people can't afford to send their students to private. And, and the bill you're referring to was a first step, and it, it, it kind of started. But it's still that income inequality that we have. It's still allowing uh, a certain class of individual to go to school um, wherever they choose to just because they have the money, and it's all wrapped up in a tax incentive for them. It doesn't allow low-income families to get a better education and doesn't allow low-income areas to take their student out of that school that might be underperforming and put them into a private school where their student has uh, a better chance. So we've got a lot of work to do uh, on that. I know we don't necessarily see eye to eye with that, but we, we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that everyone has a fair shot and everyone has an equal opportunity. And right now under the voucher program, uh, it's one-sided. I think the tax credit thing I was referring to last year was only families under the poverty line. So. And, and I said that, that was a great first yeah, yeah, step. Yeah, yeah, right, okay, right. But I, our voucher sorry. program that yeah. we have in place right now yeah. needs some serious work. No, I agree. I mean, there's, we, we, we've got to, yeah, I, think, I think Jeb Bush said it, no reform ever stops being reformed. Sure. Uh, you know, you always got to treat, keep tweaking our reforms. So when 
we come up with ideas, we always have to come back and keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So uh, I agree that is a good first step, but we just got to make sure, especially those low-income, impoverished area families can get the best education for their children if need be. And that's something, you know, it's something we're seriously trying to work on and consider. Speaking of low income, you guys want to talk about Medicaid expansion? You want me to sure. go first? Sure. Yeah, um, I, you know, I've come out, I've said I'm opposed to Medicaid expansion, and, and there's really one reason I'm opposed to it. Every bill I have seen so far, every concept minus uh, one of the concepts that we did in the House uh, that I think the Senate is looking to consider this year, I don't think they've gone as far as we did, and that was two years ago uh, in the House I'm referring to, um, was an expansion where it did not cost our taxpayer dollars. At one time, it went from 100% Medicaid funding from this, or federal funding to 90%, and we were covering the gap with, at one time we had money set aside, but it was only set aside for a period of time. After that, we're going to have to start taxing people. Uh, when you look at states that have expanded Medicaid expansion, um, you know, they said premiums want to go up. Well, they have. They said ER weights would go down. Well, they haven't. Um, so I'm adamantly against Medicaid expansion. Uh, if it's going to raise tax dollars, now I'm certainly not giving coverage. Uh, I'm certainly not against trying to get people coverage. I think there's people that need coverage out there. Um, I think there's abusers to the system uh, that we currently have in place. And, and I think what we should look to do instead of trying to expand Medicaid, instead of trying to work on something that could potentially raise tax dollars, Let's look at all the fraud that we have out currently in the system. Let's tighten up that fraud. Let's see how much money we can save. If we can save $100 million, well, that's money I could put into other families having health care. And, and we currently have some programs right now that the state pays. They pay, uh, they pay these nonprofits to go in and help people get care and assistance and pay for some of their, uh, their visits to doctors. But they're also paying them with Medicaid dollars who's turning around paying the patient, and the patient's also receiving Medicaid dollars. Well, now we're double dipping here. So we need to clean some of that up. Um, it's kind of like some of the stuff in our prison system with mental health. We've got to clean some of that up so we can save some money so we can then give that access, that, that, those individuals the access to the care that they need. Uh, and again, uh, I, you know, I'm in agreement with Travis that we need to cut on some of this fraud and we need to start investigating this and, and really cracking down on where this is. But uh, to me, this is a common sense issue. Uh, why we're not taking money from the federal government uh, is beyond me. Florida now is the highest, um, highest state in the country uh, for the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, more Floridians use it than anyone else. Um, and why we're not taking these funds from the federal government to expand and to allow more Floridians to get coverage um, is it, just silly to me. Uh, there are states where uh, taking the funds are working extremely well and states where it's uh, struggling. Uh, we need to look at a state like Kentucky that's a you know, great state that's doing well uh, with the federal funds. We need to uh, create a model like that here. Uh, Travis is in Tallahassee. He's got the opportunity um, to create the right model for us to bring this money in. Um, but right now we have residents here in St. John's County that I talk to on a daily basis that don't have health insurance and don't have coverage. Um, health insurance shouldn't just be for the wealthy or those that can afford it or those that have a job. We've got a huge gap here in the state of Florida that needs to be filled somehow. Uh, and if Tallahassee doesn't want to take the federal money, the free federal money that's available, then let's come up with a better way to close this gap. But we've got people for a long time now that don't have coverage right here in St. John's County. And, and that's, that's just unacceptable. We need to close that gap. We need to close it immediately. And let's get these people covered. Let's take this federal money. Uh, let's use it the right way. Let's look at the models that are working. And let's get it in so that these people that don't have health insurance can get covered and get them covered immediately. There's no time to waste. We're in session right now. Let's get this done. Bring the money in and let's get people covered. There's no reason that millions of Floridians should be without insurance. I guess just to kind of respond to that. Um, you know, I, I, I am in agreement we need to find a way. We do need to find a way. But when it comes to the stuff I've seen, all the bills that were out there, all the things that have been considered, at the end of the day, no one has proven to me where we can pay for it. We have to raise tax dollars. At the end of the day, six years, ten years from now, and I guess the question that I've been asking myself that, that, that maybe you want to respond to is, if I accept federal government dollars today, am I prepared to raise someone's taxes five years from now? And the answer to me is no. I am not prepared to raise someone's taxes, which is ultimately why I'm not prepared to take the federal dollars. And that's a question that if you're going to expand to the federal 
uh, federal government and take the federal dollars, that's a question that you may have to ask yourself too and what your answer would be, but that's ultimately why I've always been against every provision that's come across me because no one's proven to me after that amount of time we have enough money to cover those costs. Sure, and you just brought up a great idea before. Take those federal dollars, bring them in, and then let's start looking at the abuse and all the fraud and start finding the money that's out there already without raising the taxes, because I'm in agreement with you. I don't necessarily want to raise the taxes, but you know, you've been up there now for two years. Um, you had the opportunity, you had, you had a seat at the table when it came to bringing this money and when it came to finding money. And so for the past two years now that you've been up there, we have constituents that are uninsured that can't get the health coverage that they desperately need, that can't get the medical treatments that they desperately need, people that have to choose between paying their light bill and paying their medication bills. That's unacceptable as a representative. We've got to find a way and we've got to do it now. Uh, the way is on the table right now by bringing in the federal funds. Um, how many more people have to be sick and how many more people have to get denied coverage? How many more people have to die before we're finally gonna bring this federal funds in and, and do something about our Medicaid expansion? Well, I, I can just say as a representative for the last two years, everyone that has called my office that does not have access to care somehow has not been pointed in the right direction. When they have called our office, we have been able to get them on some type of plan through some type of nonprofit charity or organization that's got them coverage and got them the access to health care they need. So I think there's a little bit of confusion out there, but I can tell you my office has been able to help every single person that's called now. Is it thousands of people? Absolutely not. It might be 15 or 20, but we have been able to help some of those people out there, and that's what you know we're working on. And I applaud those efforts, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad you're able to do that for that small group. But again, you're, you're, you're making it so difficult for someone to get insurance. I mean, this is Florida. This is the United States. Why is it that difficult to get insurance here in, in the greatest country in the world? And I, I'm glad that you're doing that, but again, those are just people that are willing to self-identify to you. Sure. Those are people that, there's, there's still people on the streets, still people here that desperately need this coverage. We've, we've got to do better. I mean, and I, I guess the point I was making is some of them just need to make a phone call. They just don't know where to go. Sure. And, 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 you know, when we see those numbers of there's, there's, there's this many out there uninsured, well, I think some of them have pointed to the right direction. We can clean some of that up pretty darn quickly. Sure. You harken back to Jeb Bush a minute ago. I think the, <laughs> that might have been a mistake, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the last of the, I think Florida is looking at something that we haven't seen since he was governor in this big surplus, maybe as much as a billion dollars. Coming back up, and that was just that was de rigueur with him. I mean, every time he turned around, there was, you know, the, the, the county office coming up with another, you know, five or six million. <coughs> but do, does this is this money going to get spent? Should it get spent this year? Should it? Should there be some reserves or? I mean, I, I don't know how you can stop it. From well, it, spent, but. that way it kind of goes into kind of the house resolution I have, or I'm sorry, uh, um, it's not a resolution, but it's, it's a bill that I have. Um, in place right now that, that deals with our rainy day fund. Um, and what it basically does is says every time the governor vetoes a, a line item budget, so if I wanted a million dollars because I wanted to put a circus out in the middle of St. John's County, the governor says, no, that's, that's unacceptable. That money would immediately go into our rainy day fund, which is our budget stabilization fund. Right now it's sitting at about $3 billion. Ours is in the state's. Ours is in the states. That's correct. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. So the circus and the so so we ask for line item budget projects every year, water projects. I made up the circus because I knew that would get vetoed. Um, but we ask for water projects. We ask for, you know, maybe we need expansion on whatever the state stuff is uh, in, in St. Augustine actually uh, Flagler College. We've done some historical grants, but stuff gets vetoed by the governor. He he thinks they're turkeys or they're just pet projects. We're talking about $100 million a year, depending on the governor, depending on the year. I'm saying take that money instead of what happens right now is it goes back into the pot and I can spend it in the next year. I can ask for the same amount of dollars every year for that circus until it gets funded. I'm saying that's silly. If it's silly one year, don't let me ask for it the second year. Let's put it in a pot, which is our budget stabilization fund, and let's grow that fund through these special budget things that get vetoed. You know, turkeys is what you guys know them as. Let's grow our BSF through turkeys. And that way, when times come bad, instead of having to raid trusts or dollars that are set aside and these other projects that we have through doc stamps or through the amendment $1 or whatever it is, instead of raiding that money, we have now grown our budget stabilization fund. 
We have another housing economic crisis. Well, there may be $5 billion or $6 billion sitting there to fix that crisis day one because of that bill. Uh, it's something I'll run again next year when I'm in the Senate. Um, so that's something I think that can fix some of that stuff. Now, does it all get spent this year? Back to your question, sorry for rambling on that, but does it all get spent this year? You know, by law, we have to balance our budget. Now, the question is, what do we spend it on? The biggest things we spend it on right now, uh, in terms of our discretionary dollars, what the state of Florida is allowed to do is education. All of our money, or not all, but a majority of our money is spent on education. Our second thing is health care. Um, that's where we get into some of the fraud that we need to clean up. I don't think there's fraud in education spending. In fact, I agree there's not enough in education spending, but there's some fraud in our health care spending. And that's what we need to clean up so we can start shifting that pile back into education. And uh, ultimately, it's going to be uh, decided, you know, as we get the allocation processes, what, what, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Some tax credit stuff's being talked about right now. Um, and what makes sense there? Uh, do we do we decide through the legislative uh, budget committees that we want to give money to the Speedway or to the uh, uh, Orlando Sydney <coughs> soccer team? Um, so it's it's something that's going to be a work in progress through the committee. But at the end of the day, we have to balance our budget, and uh, we obviously will do so. We have to by constitution. Uh, and just to respond, and you know, I think there's a you initially had asked if we should spend all all that surplus and where it goes, or if we should put it in a rainy day fund. And I, I think the real answer to that is we've, we've got to look at kind of a 50-50 option. Um, we can't just blow everything that, that we've managed to come up in the surplus right now. Uh, we do have to put some of it aside in a rainy day fund to make sure we've got uh, the money for the future. But we also need to look at, as, as Travis said, education. You know, our teachers, uh, you know, if you look at their salaries for the past 10 years, I mean, they, they virtually have stayed the same uh, other than some cost of living increases. We need to look at uh, salaries for our teachers and make sure we have the best quality teachers here. Uh, we need to fund our school districts, make sure that the technology that we have in the system uh, is the best. Travis uh, talked about some industrial arts programs before. Like I said, those are very expensive programs. Technology, our STEM program, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, we know that those are the jobs that are going to compete tomorrow. Uh, we know that STEM is, is a critical uh, area that we need to teach and we need to expand on because we're getting outpaced by other countries right now. Uh, we need to focus on our STEM programs, and, and they need to be funded is, is what really needs to happen. Um, and so I think there's a combination. I think we really need to look at education and, and uh, again, Medicaid and where we can uh, put those funds and kind of catch up for, for not giving them any uh, for so many years now. You mentioned you mentioned raining doc stamps. Mm -hmm. Is that ever going to stop? Uh, you know that's that's why I kind of put sweeping the bill is right, the sweeping. That's sweeping. that's kind of why I put the bill in place. The bill I put just mentioned in place. Uh, I want it to, to pass it eventually. Uh, I would have to to look it up and get it to you. It's, if you go to my sponsor bill okay. page, it's the first bill I have. Uh, it's called vetoed appropriations. Is the title of it. Um, you know I I don't know if we could ever stop sweeping the trust. I mean, uh, you know, it's up to Speaker, President, you know, everybody else, plus those that vote on the budget. We constitutionally have to pass the budget. So, I mean, if we went 100% down on the budget on both sides, we have violated our constitutional duty. Um, so when you come into this trust, it's, it's a tricky thing. Now, I don't ever want to touch this trust. That is money promised to the people set aside. We never should touch them. And again, that's why I have that bill that I put out there in place, so that we can grow our budget stabilization fund, which is literally, and by the way, the definition of the budget stabilization fund, when you look at, look at it in, in, in its context and state law, it's literally used to stabilize the budget. I mean, that's, that's the summary of it. So we can only use that money to stabilize the budget. We can never raid from it or sweep it or anything. So if we ever fall on bad times, there's no reason to touch these dollars. We've got this in here that we put in place. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's just something I'm trying to get done that hopefully will be, be good for the people. Does the amendment one thing now that it's got a bigger bite or a big? And it's 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 a difficult thing. It's probably too difficult to explain. But I mean, I did, with with the amendment one dollars, there's a bill now which which all the uh, um, home. Excuse me, I'm just I'm rambling a little. No, you're fine. At any rate, the the amendment one money's coming. To, the, the bill is sort of taking it the 33 percent off the top and then giving affordable housing and everything, which was, I think, at around 16%, and then there's economic development, which is about 12%. But instead of getting 12% from the 
the bill now gives the housing the 16% of the 66%. Is this the Senate, is this the Senate version? Yeah, I think it's in the House, but, but, but I think it's... We, we passed our House bill okay. with Amendment 1, and that did more quality, this quantity, is way, This cleanup. is the way they're sort of... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I know the Senate this. version has bike trails in it it's and all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah. The, the House just, this is the way they're allocating it. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying that the, 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 the wildlife environment is 33, and, oh, I see and, what you're saying. Water you quality know, housing cleaning. gets I, I feel. 16. The 33 comes off the top, and affordable housing gets 16 percent of the 66 left, rather than 16 percent of the 100 percent. And there's, I think there's two bills. I think there, I think there are. And that was two. You know, it could have, it could have changed in the sure. week too. Yeah, I, I haven't but seen it. But, 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 but the, the affordable housing people are really uh, upset about it. I mean, it's it's a huge cut. Yeah. It's almost half. That way, of, it, of, it's of some of the money. Dockstep money, yeah. And all it really does, if you look at, at it, all it does is leave more to sweep at the bottom. Right. You know what I mean? So, take a look at it. But no, absolutely. But I know if you, if you look at the people that's, and you know, the affordable housing here, it's not just people can't afford it. I mean, we're, we're looking at, we were at uh, the Mental Health Consortium, and they're talking about bringing the people in, Baker Act, and then they got no place to go. I mean, mm -hmm. the housing is a lot more than just people. And, right. And, affordable. Mm -hmm. and, and they do a lot of, you know, I guess I'm, rambling on it, but they do they do an awful lot of work mm -hmm. of giving vets homes and fixing things up and ramps and things like that. So well the service that we're talking about some of these look at it, it's an interesting way they're they're just sort of yeah. Some of these bills are changed by the hour. I mean it, as as we're in session right now and, and they're changing and I know that Travis has been up there fighting uh, for us to get some money here. Um, and it was something that I had said uh, before, you know, John Thrasher stepping down hurt this area in the sense that we don't have representation on the Senate side. You know, the special election is costing us over a million dollars here just to, to run this election. And uh, some of these bills, as, as you're speaking about, um, our campaign is trying to stay up to date as, as quickly as we can. I know Travis is up there uh, working on them, but some of them are changing. <laughs> Good luck staying up to date. I've, I've been pulled out of the committee before <laughs> saying the bill on my Senate side has done this, this, and this. And I've had to run over to talk to the sponsor. So. Absolutely. And so we want to make sure we get representation on the Senate side uh, immediately so that we're getting our fair share here in the district. And um, we've got to, we've really got to look at where we're spending and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think a bit of one, we're, we're still, uh, you know, we passed our version off the House floor. The Senate and I uh, and, and the House do not see eye to eye right now. Um, and we all know they have to in order to pass to go to the governor and become law. So, um, you know, it, it's a constant conversation back and forth. It was sold as this is going to be a land by to preserve land. Vote for this bill. Mm -hmm. But when you read it, there's a lot of other things in there that was legally put in there and had to legally be put in there. So what can we do with that? Are we just going to buy land or are we going to start fixing some of our water resource programs, which we've been trying to do across mm -hmm. the state for a while. Um, before Amendment Loan Dollars, we had already had water projects to fix some of our water problems. Well, some of us are looking at this as, well, now there's extra dollars going to be set aside so we can expedite some of these water problem mm -hmm. issues. Um, and, you know, there's, 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 there's numeric nutrient drain offs into our springs. Uh, there's, there's sewer t or septic tanks going into Involucia, into our mm -hmm. intercoastal. I mean, there's some stuff that really needs to be fixed. And do we use these dollars to catalyst this? And is that what was intended in Amendment 1 and sold to the people? Or is that what the people voted on? And ultimately, that's kind of where we're trying to figure out from both the House and the Senate side and see what mm -hmm. makes sense. And, and ultimately, you see what's constitutional. I mean, we certainly don't want to pass something that's unconstitutional that we're going to have to come back again and refix. So we're, we're, it's a constant negotiation struggle of what really was meant by the people and what really can we do to do good things with. And, and I think a lot of people understand, too, that, that that's not all new money that the, the minimum one. Right. Florida, right. Florida Forever was, was about right. 500 million. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. this is 750 million if mm -hmm. they to get the whole cut. So mm -hmm. it's not all found money. Right. It's because they, they killed 500 and picked up the others. Mm -hmm. So it's about a 30% yeah. gain. But, mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Really glad it's, it, I, I understand what you're saying. The other issue is what is. Echoes. What, what, is, what can you spend yeah, it on? Yeah, some of, of course. Some of them are, you know, sewer pipes and things like yeah. that. So yeah. I mean, we certainly, we certainly want to do good things for the state. I don't think anybody up there is going to say, you know, everybody up there understands it's for water and it's for restoration and preservation. Now, no one's arguing that fact. Uh, no one's out there trying to do, you know, a stadium in the middle of nowhere with this, with this money. They know they want to do good things. The question is, what can we do that's good? What can we catalyst? And what 
we'll pass constitutional muster because although we want to do good things, we certainly want to still be bound by the Constitution and make sure this is a good bill. And that's what we're working on now. And it's, it's still early in the process, guys. I mean, this thing may change 15 times before day, day 60. So uh, we're, we're just trying to monitor it all and make sure we're doing the right thing. No, not, not specifically, but we know there are things that we're not asking that you might want to talk about. So if there's something that we didn't bring up that you want to bring up right now, that now's the time. And there's, I'm sure there are questions that, or issues that you might want to talk about. So. Well, you know, Travis and I have had a great dialogue uh, over the course of this very, very short campaign and uh, being a special election. Um, we've both had the experience coming from last year's elections into this, and I think we both have a good uh, handle on what this community needs. And, and it's a matter of getting up there and fighting for St. John's County specifically, uh, Flagler County, Putnam County, and Volusia County, making sure that we're well representative and making sure that we have a representative that truly understands what the people want here, uh, is in touch with them each and every day. Um, that's why I think my education background, my community service, and, and what I do in the community each and every day uh, is what will really resonate uh, with voters and, and what we can do best up in Tallahassee. So um, we've had a great opportunity to talk many, many times. Uh, we want to get to Tallahassee and we want to get to work. Uh, the special election was a tight time frame and, and it was difficult because we're going to come into this in the middle uh, on April 8th. And uh, I look forward to getting up there and getting to work. All right. Just just to highlight, you know, thanks for the opportunity, obviously, and, and thanks, David, for, for being so accommodating. And most people don't know, but this was scheduled on Wednesday when I was in Tallahassee, so we were all being able to move it over here to Friday, um, which, which I, I truly appreciate, um, you know, my background and, and what I've done and what I've done up there. You know, I've, I've filed several bills that have created jobs, created business, worked on uh, small business, and, and worked on business, actually uh, loans for minority business, more access to that. Um, so I'm trying to create jobs throughout this district. Uh, the very St. John's is great uh, in the north part with, with jobs, and, and, and the unemployment is, is very low. But when you get into Flag Revolution and even Putnam, there's some serious problems with jobs and job creation, and that's what I'm trying to focus on, uh, as well as making sure taxes are low and, and keeping government limited with the checks and balances on, on some of these authorities. So um, you know that's that's what I stand for, and um, you know. Very fortunate that I'm still up there today. On August 6th, I resign. August 7th, one of us will win. And, you know, if, if it's not me, I'm just glad to have been able to serve for the past two years. So just thank you guys for the time. I, nobody does good at that. I have a question that just came up. I really, I really sure. want to ask you guys one more thing. We can't go anywhere, I don't think because so. It's, yeah, because the Senate District is a big district. Mm -hmm. um, you look at Putnam County, and we brought that up, and you look at St. John's County, and there's a huge disparity. I we're, we're, we call it a different assessment of disparity. I mean, there's a lot more here than there is there. As a legislator for the district, do you guys see it as sort of shuffling things around to even things up, or is it just every county for itself type of thing? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I don't. Do you see any reason to take a little from a St. John's County to go to a Putnam County? Because, I mean, I mean, if, unless I'm wrong, I mean, they're they're pretty desperate. You know, it's something, straight. and we see this every day because we're, mm -hmm. you know, I was in Daytona this morning. We're in St. John's uh, this afternoon and over in Putnam. And so we see that every day. I saw that in our congressional race. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of taking from one and, and giving to another. Um, I think it's a matter of understanding what each of the communities are and how vastly different uh, Palaka is versus St. Augustine. Uh, and I think it's a matter of being that representative that's in those communities and understanding the people that live there and what their needs are. Uh, the needs of each community are, are, are very, very different. Um, and understanding them enough to make sure that you're uh, uh, in appropriations and getting the right funding for those folks. Uh, you talked about the dam issue uh, earlier today and making sure that you know that that's a priority for them and getting there uh, and getting those people what they need and representing them. Which dam um, issue were you? Oh, the dam yeah. issue. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and so knowing the areas. That was a noun, not a verb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, knowing the issues of each each town, uh, understanding, you know, Flagler County is one of the highest unemployment rates uh, in the state of Florida. It kind of bounces back and forth. Understanding that, you know, unemployment, uh, environment is a huge issue for for us uh, in Flagler County. Uh, we talk about beach erosion, we talk about those things. So really knowing each of the counties individually, um, understanding what St. John's uh, County needs uh, to have a retirement community in certain areas and, and understanding what that means to them. And I think Medicaid and uh, some expansion, some growth helps them as well. So um, I don't think it's a case of we're gonna 
move money from one county to another. I think it's a matter of focusing on the money that that county needs and getting them their specific needs met. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with David. It's it's pretty much um, it, it's pretty much the priorities of the counties. When you go through the delegation meeting process, you know, you're you're fortunate enough. That one of us will be in. There will be a senator representing them. So you have a representative on the on the other side at the other chamber. So if you're in St. John's, for example, let's say Senator Thrasher was here today, St. John's has four or five priorities they presented to us. Mm -hmm. He knows those are the St. John's priorities for him. <clears throat> he also knows there's House members working those priorities on the other side of the aisle. Putnam's priorities are completely different in terms of what they're asking and what they need. From a policy side, you're going to have to hear what their delegation policies are and put them in place. You will have to pick and choose when it comes to the global things. Does Medicaid expansion help or hurt one county versus the other? And that's, you're just going to have to listen to your constituents, go with your gut on. But in terms of the appropriations, you're not really appealing one from the other. I can tell you right now, St. John's school districts need money. Uh, Flagler College needs a little money for restoration. We've got Summer Haven drainage. That's part of a big deal. Putnam's issues aren't that. They're, we're taking the, the uh, St. John's Community College, or I guess it's St. John's State College School now, um, and, and the Technical College, I can't remember what the name changed to. I was Votech when I was in high school, but we're taking that college and they're working on putting that in Putnam um, to help with job creation and help get those, those schools there. So that's it's a completely different budget than asking for water money. So you're in different sure. silos and, and fortunately we've got another representative over there focusing on that. So, you know, as a senator, you just, you take the big picture, you take your ask, you kind of put them in, but then you need the representatives to help put them in as well. And it really is, it's not as much as a constant struggle balance with, with dollars or policy, um, but it's more of a just focusing on the community and making sure you're in touch with your representative and the community itself, and you're all working together for the common good. Cool. I appreciate you guys coming in. You, you're, you seem together on a lot of things. You seem like a whole lot more DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a whole lot more in common than uh, DeSantis and I had. So. I, I, I think that if you, if you look at state government, the way it's set up, we're there for 60 days, we go back home, we live under mm -hmm. the laws that we do, and when we're up there, we, we are forced to get along. I mean, the people want us to pass up, they get 60 days. Now, we not always do agree on everything, but when you see us, as Republicans and Democrats, we eat in the same lunchroom. Mm -hmm. We're in the same meetings. Heck, we hang out afterwards, even if we're, you know, if we are at a, after session, some of us may get together for vacation with our families, you know, and everything. So we get along. Uh, I think at the federal government level, there, and by the way, the state, we have bipartisan staff too. So I think at the federal government level, they're kind of separate in the sense that different staff, different areas, different meetings, they don't see each other enough. So they're not forced into an environment where they can be as organic as we are. And that's kind of why I like state government. Uh, no offense, Ron DeSantis, but a lot better than federal government. Just, <laughs> I, so you guys are we, yeah. Well, <laughs> well and, and a lot of these issues that our, our county faces uh, aren't Republican or Democrat issues, right? When somebody doesn't have insurance, it doesn't matter whether they have a D or an R behind their name. They need insurance. Uh, you know, education. We need to fund education. These, are, these aren't Republican or Democrat ideals, and I think we can come together uh, on a lot of things and, and find uh, a happy medium, so to speak, and, and, and work together to... Uh, enhance this community. And the, the day that uh, Travis won, you know, I called him up the next day. I said, hey, uh, let's work together to improve our community in the next uh, 60 days that we had and, and have great dialogue and um, really move this area forward. And that's what we're both about. And, and the fact is 60 days, I mean, up at the federal government, <laughs> they don't have, they're not constitutionally bound to do really anything. We we have to pass a budget. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So <clears throat> again, it, 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 it makes us work together, but it's, it's for the good of Florida. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.